I'm not showing off, I just know what it means. <laughs> okay. I have a contact in Russia named Ulaine, and in roughly 1999, he sent me a URL about this Russian scientist uh, and a flying platform. And I, I, I went and looked at it. This is the cover off of the book, which I managed to get from Russia, so, <laughs> all in Russian. Uh, Grubenikov discovered something called a cavity structural effect. And it's basically what we're talking about with tubes and the uh, frequencies that cancel themselves. And also they interact with biological and also physical material. Oh, by the way, Grubenikov says there are the two most common materials in this world are cellulose, because it doesn't decay, and chitin. Chitin is spelled C-H-I-T-I-N. That's what all insects are made out of, chitin. It's the shells, the body. It, beetles, roaches, butterflies, everything's made out of cotton, and it doesn't dissolve and it doesn't die. So all the dust in your house, that's billion-year-old bugs that are still grumbled and falling. <laughs> but what's interesting about cotton, cotton is dielectric. The Casimir plates are dielectric. They repel electricity. These nanostructure arrays, when you look at them under a microscope, this is what they look like. This is excreted by the bug in growing its tissues, you know, the, the cotton. That's what it looks like as you, as you go significantly greater magnifications. That's what you see, finer and finer. Look like it's machined. It's almost perfect. Go to the next one, please. This is even a finer magnification. And these are those little resonating cavities that appear to pick up. The lower you go, the higher frequencies, like a straw with a certain frequency, like organ pipes. As the organ pipes change in, in, in length, the frequency goes up. So the deeper you go into mass with these resonating structures, eventually you're going to hit Cater's frequency below infrared terahertz, and you would be able to cancel gravity. So this, that's what all this is leading to, part of it. He, the original experiment, he's looking at a microscope. This one particular bug, he won't tell us if it's a beetle, uh, a, uh, uh, a beetle or a butterfly or some kind of a wasp. He won't, won't tell the genus of the insect. But he claims he, he had, he had uh, was looking at one little piece of it, a concave, you know, concave, it looks like a, a satellite dish. And he's looking at that under a microscope. It's a chitin plate, chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. He's looking at it under a microscope, looking at this extremely precise uh, nanostructure array. Well, this, he, this is an electron microscope. But in this one, he's looking at these star shapes all on these concave plates. And he happened to take a pair of tweezers, and, and he had another one like this, and he dragged it across, and it jumped out of the tweezers and floated up in the air and fell off to the side. So he thought, I've been working too long. <laughs> so he takes it out from under the microscope. He does it again, and it floats up out of the air <laughs> and floats back down. So he goes out and kills a bunch of these bugs and rips off their wings, <laughs> and he glues them all to this board, da -da -da -da, like a grid, 10 by 10, something like that. And he sets it where all the cups are facing up, and he drops an ink pen on it, and the ink pen floats in the air. <laughs> he drops a tack on it, and the tack floats in the air. He turns the board upside down, and the board floats in the air. It's like, whoa. <laughs> so, uh, and it all sounds like BS, but remember, fluctuations, zero-point energy, and training, the whole bit. Okay. Uh, he said, the detail broke loose from my tweezers. It hung suspended in the air, and then it fell back. He ties these panels together, and he makes these panel blocks made out of cotton. Okay. So they're basically little repelling blocks. Okay. Uh, array levitation of pen, tack, and other objects. He says, I'm not naming the class to which this insect belongs. It seems on the verge of extinction. He's a big tree hugger. I have no problem with tree huggers. But uh, he's... He, you know, you got to protect as much as you can. And he, he doesn't want to give the name of this because he thinks if this gets out to the world, they'll come in and take every bug they can. I wrote him a letter and I said, look, we don't care about the name of the bug. Just send us a couple of samples. If we can duplicate the effect, prove it's not electrostatic, it's not electromagnetic, we can make artificial, just, uh, you know, analyze it with an acoustic microscope, I mean, a scanning microscope, get the specific dimension. Is it hexagonal, you know, tet tetragon, tetragon what? And make it into an array. What is the structure, the size? Is it on angstroms, micrometers, what? And just run off sheets of this stuff. So if you, you made a pair of coveralls of this stuff, you'd float in the air like a big balloon. <laughs> so, oh, it gets better. <laughs> so, this is Grabinikov holding uh, what all this led to. It looks like a, he's an artist. So he goes out in the country and he takes his paints and stuff. This is like an artist set and it folds up, you know. So normally it unfolds and it's got all the palettes and all. Uh, next one, please. So he basically has hand grips, he's got a left hand grip and a right hand grip, clutch cables, like a motorcycle. And notice he's got little wing nuts to attach them all. Next one, please. This fits on top of this, and that fits onto the board when it's un unpopped, when it's un the hinges are open, and it's all wing netted together. No notice, no batteries, no light, no nothing. It's just natural. This box is hollow underneath, by the way. Next one, please. This is uh, 
Professor Grubinikov, this is the actual stand, what it looks like. So you stand on this thing, and you turn these clutch cables. Next one, please. <laughs> this is Professor Grubinikov standing on this machine, and notice the shadow is directly on the ground. Next one, please. And this is when he's floating off the air, in the air, from these wing structures off these bugs. Totally natural effect. No electricity, no nothing. This is the underside of the platform from the book. Now, if you notice, uh, in the upper, uh, he, he stylizes it with, it doesn't glow and have colors and all like that. But, Chuck, can you pull this piece here? Uh, no, right where your hand is. Move that in the center, please. Okay. You notice all those little veins? Okay. And, and he, he, said, he said, I'm right about this. So, uh, in each corner of the box, he went out and he got popsicle sticks, flat popsicle sticks, and he glues 10 of these little cups on top of the popsicle stick. And he's got all these sticks lined up with a common rod, so when he opens it, he's got a Japanese fan. That's what those fans are. In the back, there's, uh, next one, please. In the, in the, there's the cups, there's the, the popsicle stick, there's the rod holding all the sticks together to form the fan. There's the four fans in the corner of these, this hollow box. One set of clutch, one clutch cable controls the two in the front. The uh, clutch cable on the other side controls the two in the back. When he opens the clutch cable simultaneously, he gets equal lift and he floats up off the ground. If he wants to go, he goes up to a thousand feet. With the amount of uh, cups he's got and the repulsion ability they have, he can only go to a thousand feet. He says he, his fastest he's ever gone, 920 miles an hour. And he, <laughs> it's not a translation error. He, he says. When he's flying, that there's like an energy grid around him. Now, I don't know if you know much about levitation reports and stuff, but John Keeley said when he flew his flying machine that he went, floated up in the air, flew 500 miles an hour, came back, and not a hair on his head was mussed. It's like an energy bubble around him. Why? Because gravity has been repelled away from you. Therefore, wind and everything else has been repelled away from you. So it, it's po quite possible he could do this. And you say, well, all he can do is go up. How does he go forward? Well... He turns, half turns one of the clutch cables, so the two fans in the front are half closed, and that causes him to tilt forward, and he flies forward. That's how he goes. And when he, he flies it like a surfboard. So Now, you want to ride something like that? It's out in the parking lot. <laughs> okay. Now, the next one, please. When he's on this thing, he's, it's invisible. It's not totally invisible, but if you look up, you see a, a real thin blur. You wouldn't know what it was. Why? Because gravity is, it, it entrains the light, and it's like a... It goes around the ship and, or around the machine and recombines at the bottom. So when you look up, he's completely invisible. That's what he says. Uh, oh, he said, the speed of my flight is quite high. There is no wind in my ears. The platform's force field has carved out from space an upward diverging invisible column that cuts the platform off from the Earth's gravitational field. But it left me and the air column intact. I think that all this, as it were, are parts, uh, are parts of space in flight, and then it closes, uh, it parts space when he flies through it, and the space closes when he goes past that area. Uh, as far as speed and height, he says, my Gravito platform is a homemade device uh, capable of developing the zenithal pull of at least 100 grams, which equates to 220 pounds. That's how much lift does he have. He can lift 220 pounds with this machine with the number of cups that he has attached to it in this fan configuration. He says the horizontal speed of uh, 30 to 40 kilometers a minute, which translates to 24 miles a minute. He says, uh, I never fly faster than 25 kilometers a minute, which is uh, nine, uh, maximum 930 miles an hour, preferring to go 10 times slower, which is roughly 93 miles an hour. That's what he writes. He says, I'm, I'm flying about 300 meters, which is 984 feet, so he can go maximum of 1,000 feet above the ground based on the lift of this machine. Okay, now the spooky stuff. <laughs> <laughs> The really spooky stuff, I, I, this is nothing. This is nothing. Okay, think about it. In relativity, they say that the, the more gravity that flows into a mass, the uh, slower the time. Okay, when this guy leaves, he gets on his machine. He looks at his watch. It says 8 o'clock. He looks at the kitchen clock. It says 8 o'clock. He goes around flying. He looks at his watch. It says 9 o'clock. He lands. He goes into the kitchen. It says 10 o'clock. His watch says 9 o'clock. kitchen says 10 o'clock. When you go out into space, you don't age at light speed. So, but, and why? Because there's no gravity in space. You don't age. So, and he said when he's in a reduced gravity environment, which is what this machine, he's inside this bubble, so he's moving at a much slower time because he has much less gravity. So every planet with its weight has a different time scale based on the gravity determined. Keely used to say, time is gravity.
I had for 40 years I tried to get uh, people interested in in levitation and teleportation things of that nature which were very simple to me and the people I worked with but nobody uh, they either didn't believe it or they thought well it's just not going to happen or something so anyway along came Project Camelot and said that the time now is changing where people would listen now to uh, things that I once said were scoffed at or not listened to and they uh, asked me if I'd do an interview. So I, I said okay so they took one interview and uh, I don't know the sound on it didn't come out right so they came back and did another interview and <clears throat> that somehow got on I didn't know it was going on the internet but it went on the internet and uh, I started getting um, responsive calls from people from my, on my email and, and some of the phone numbers that I had let out. And people said, yeah, we are really genuinely interested. We want to hear what you're talking about and see if, uh, see if there's any value there that we can use to, to uh, foster this technology. Um, I would have, I would have brought, I would have come in on one of our craft, truly, if it hadn't been confiscated 40 years ago. It was taken and put in some place in, I think it was called, um, it's in New Mexico. It's an underground facility that the government has, and it's nine, nine stories down. It was seen by a professor friend of mine uh, several years after, after it was confiscated. And I was uh, told that they had tried to <clears throat> operate it, which was unsuccessful. They tried to mount weapons on it, which was also unsuccessful. And the reason was because they didn't have the keys. They, they didn't know how to operate it because the keys lie in consciousness, in a conscious awareness of what they're looking at. Um, tomorrow morning, uh, you'll be listening to a, a good friend of mine, Jim Murray, who has a device that's been working for years that <clears throat> scientists from all over the world have looked at his machine and verified uh, to everybody's satisfaction that it was a working machine putting out more energy than it was drawing. and. Uh, the group that was interested in it said, well, yeah, but it's working, but uh, it's, it's violating the second law of thermodynamics. You can't have something working like this. It doesn't, our science says it can't work, even though they were seeing that it, you know, a working, a working machine. So that's been my story as well, all these, all these years. I, I show them levitation, I show them teleportation, and, uh, and it's quite simple. The, the principles of all, everything I'm going to talk about tonight is simplicity. There's no, there's, no, uh, there's no heavy studying or learning or academic uh, education necessary to understand um, the laws of nature. And that's, that's my premise. <clears throat> when I was a kid, I loved magnetics. I played with Every time I got a hold of a magnet, I had to figure out what I could do with it and turn it upside down and put it with another magnet and so forth. And I just, I just uh, saw the simplicity of magnetism. And I also saw that along with all the um, uh, benefits of magnetism, which is electricity and electromagnetics, et cetera, et cetera, <clears throat> magnetism itself is a great power is a, a power second to none, really, in the whole universe. Um, let's see, here's a, here's a picture of, the, uh, of a 45-foot craft that we had. And uh, this was in, uh, we had one in, in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Carr had that in, in Norman, Oklahoma. He, was, um, he put in for a patent for a levitation device. Uh, to levitate and, and float these craft around and, and uh, his idea was to go back and forth to the moon and so forth and so on. Um, 
the patent office looked at it and said, well, no, there's no such thing as levitation now. I mean, we, that's ridiculous. We can't, give you a, we can't give you a patent on that. <laughs> Unbelievable. I've seen electricity go right into the objects and a million pieces just fly apart. In fact, using only 75 watts of energy, enough for a small light bulb, Hutchison made a 60-pound cannonball rise off the table. It would also fuse dissimilar materials, heat metal, but not burn the wood it sat on, shatter metal, as well as change its crystalline structure. This was something to write home about. Dubbed by some as the poltergeist machine, there is no one machine, just a lot of old army surplus gear, randomly tuned by John. No one knows how it works. John has apparently figured out the right combination of radio waves and electrical energy to create the effect. If it could be proven, its impact would be huge. You'd have to rewrite most of the science textbooks. A random event happened in 1989 when a visiting Vancouver news crew was setting up at John's lab to film the Hutchison effect. The target area was that yellow crate with the metal objects. But to everyone's shock, a sponge in the back of the room took off into the air and then fell back down. John didn't actually see it and was genuinely surprised. Like that, it went up and hit the ceiling one second, maybe two seconds, and then came down. Kind of kidding, no? Well, some time ago I was doing some testing and got into some big trouble after I levitated a toy UFO and some other objects. Apparently, John's experiments were lifting objects in nearby homes, and the neighbors called the police. The police came full bore in here with engineers, inspectors. They photographed all the equipments very carefully. It's almost like if you called in a cleaning, cleaning crew. They didn't touch anything. It's like they made everything look neater for some strange reason. It seems like someone in the shadows still cares what our hero is up to. Frustrated by authorities and lack of recognition, John has been spending time developing his new project, batteries that last forever, based on the somewhat bizarre zero-point energy theory. Followers of this theory believe that all physical matter floats in a sea of energy. Widespread attention from businessmen and government scientists since 1979, when he began using ultra-high electromagnetic frequencies to transform matter in some very unusual ways. It has come to be known as the Hutchison effect. The objects you're seeing um, moving there is a form of levitation by uh, translational movement, meaning that the objects become lighter and can float around, the heaviest being the barium cylinder that you see there um, with the two wires coming out of it, it tends to slide around on seven pounds of its own weight. The physics of it is self-resonation of what they call ferromagnetic and piezoelectric barium type name uh, through a power amplifier and broad and narrow uh, bands of electrical energy going into this crystal. So the applications of this in advanced applications using free energy or zero-point energy to power it would be in uh, propulsion technologies. This is a crystal converter unit that I made about a year ago to see if the principle worked, and indeed it seems to work to this day. Um, the principles involve the Casimir effect and uh, space charge type of barrier technology in semiconductors and um, a, a jitter activity called zero-point energy that goes through time and space. The idea is to get the material inside this to interface with the uh, jittering action of zero-point energy. And moving on to what they may look like inside, I actually bring out a piece here of this material of common minerals and that produced in a special way, and I take a reading here. And I should be getting a higher reading. I had a hot spot somewhere on here. 
I have here almost a half a volt, as you can see. As one can see, there's no batteries in this or anything else except this crystalline material with different uh, configurations. And this is a steady state. It's always that and has been tested up to a year's time and under stress tests also. So, which made me decide to then, of course, mount the same material in cylinders. Different cylinders, of course, there are different mixes in there, and I found that uh, that some of the cylinders are not as powerful as this material here, or this very tiny one here. Actually, this has more power than this large artillery shell unit here. And what I want to do, of course, is to um, <coughs> demonstrate it in the sense of it making actual power. And that means to turn on a small motor. Okay, I'm attaching this to the base here. Another lead to the top, and it should spin, which it does. So, yeah, basically, this kind of material powering motors. Of course, it's a very small motor at this time, but scaled up in larger amounts of, of material and power up to uh, several horsepower if needed. Hutchison hopes his simple shake-and-bake method of producing these crystal energy converters will attract investors who can see the potential of permanent batteries which never need charging. Non-toxic that will interface with zero-point energy in space and time. Hutchison's more dramatic experiments border on the paranormal and have generated more than just a passing interest from U.S. military research. Now, when we analyze that, we find...